Um, and the topic of my talk is uh, narrative voices in contemporary healthcare encounters. Um, and uh, obviously, I'm very happy to um, to take uh, questions and uh, points um, uh, afterwards. So please feel free to um, chip in. Um, narrative is a very fuzzy and capacious concept. Um, and I'm not going to spend a great deal of time going into its definition, but for the purposes of a talk like this, I take it to be an account of happenings of experience in the external or the inner world that unfolds or begins to unfold uh, a pattern. And I say begins to unfold, to emphasize that narrative is a formulation that has shape and order, but as a result of interruption, planned as in serialization or unplanned, um, may provisionally or ultimately be incomplete. The literary scholar Richard Norman holds that narrative gets its power from the presentation of particular individuals living particular lives and having particular experiences, which other people identify with because they recognize in it aspects of their own situation or contrasts from it. Mention of people identifying with and distancing themselves from a narrative suggests it has a relational context, uh, but that also it evokes relational responses from audiences. And this will be a, a kind of sub-theme of, of my talk. As we'll see, narratives also concern themselves with generic patterns of events and happenings, delineated through foregrounding information, emphasizing it, placing it in the background or omitting it altogether. Healthcare narratives are accounts voiced in person, verbally, gesturally, even posturally, in sounds punctuated, perhaps with sighs and silences, accounts which in one way or another find their way into letters, case notes, case reports, and disease descriptions. But beyond healthcare, narrative voices articulate thoughts and feelings in bodily languages, such as I've mentioned, posture, but also mime, dance, in the written language of the pen, printing press, and the computer word processor, the language of uh, the visual uh, arts uh, expressed through pencil, crayon, and the plastic arts, activities that are all directed towards audiences. Aristotle held the voice to be that which arises from the soul. Nothing without soul utters voice, he wrote in the De Anima. It is the means through which sentience, thought and intention are expressed and communicated. By telling, questioning and conversing, narrative voices share information, experiences and points to view. And these are the building blocks of medical knowledge. That might sound a bit odd in this evidence-based era, but I hope that's something that we can pick up perhaps in the discussion. For without narrative voices, what would we know of the enormous variety of symptoms or of the experiences of people living with long COVID? There'd be almost no understanding of mental health conditions or of complex illnesses such as post-polio syndrome, for example. As I've already hinted, although voices may be heard, they may not seem compelling. They may be interrupted, ignored, spoken over and erased. My talk focuses on the narrative voices of patients and how healthcare practitioners adopt and adapt snippets of these voices in different settings and periods. Advice from a contemporary cardiologist on how to commence a medication. A recent memoir centered on chest pain, a generic narrative of angina by the 18th century physician, William Heberden, that has been enormously influential. A letter of an 18th century doctor about his own chest pain. And finally, a 20th century dialogue rendered in poetry about a Scottish man who has heart failure. These scenarios all revolve around chest pain. And that's because 
I first developed this talk in the Heart and Lung Institute at Singapore a couple of years ago and have since developed it uh, at talks given to the Society of Medical Humanities at Cambridge, UK. And again, I have further developed it for this particular occasion. And although my talk is called Narrative Voices in Contemporary Healthcare Encounters, I've deliberately included some 18th century material to show how, in fact, that contrasts with the situation at present, but also feeds into it. And we might pick up in the discussion the importance of the historical influences on the current uh, practice of medicine, which I do think is a very major component of the medical humanities. So just to put that in context. The renowned professor of cardiology at Harvard, Bernard Laun, who recently died aged 100, in a 2008 paper entitled How Physicians Should Introduce Patients to the Use of Nitroglycerin, wrote, many years of experience in cardiology persuades me that patients with angina who use nitroglycerin properly feel more in control and consequently have a better prognosis. Regrettably, most patients are inadequately and inappropriately count, uh, counseled on its use. A common practice is to hand the patient a prescription with the sole instruction to put the pill under the tongue during chest discomfort. The doctor often alerts the patient use of, uh, that this use may be associated with lightheadedness or a throbbing headache. They generally reserve it for a more severe episode of angina that does not immediately abate when they stop whatever they are doing. Lown claims that what he calls proper use of nitroglycerin leads to a better prognosis, motivated by a psychological factor, namely the patient feeling in control. In this formulation, it's not clear whether it's the pharmacological effect of the drug or that effect plus the feeling of being in control that's the active ingredient of the efficacy here. The two are bundled together as a composite force that sits in the shadow of a counter narrative about the drug's unhelpful, unwanted side effects, which he believes leads to its misuse and discontinuation. Before giving patients the prescription, I'd hand them a 0.4 milligram nitroglycerin tablet and ask it to be placed under the tongue. Usually this was greeted with puzzlement and reluctance at the time, uh, at reluctance since at the time they were not experiencing angina. They were assured, assured that the exercise was intended for me to learn their response to the medication. As soon as the nitroglycerin was taken, I started a stopwatch. The patient was informed to be expecting a tingling sensation under the tongue, indicating that the pill was active. Then I continued in the following vein. You'll soon experience a pleasant throbbing sensation in the head, indicating increased blood flow to your brain. We all can benefit from more oxygen to our brains. The flushing of your face and the slight throb in your head is a good sign. It indicates that the same increase of blood flow is also happening in your heart. When you feel the nice sensation in your head, you can be assured that the decreased blood flow to your heart muscle is now corrected. This is why your angina appears, disappears so promptly." Unquote. So we see here that Laun wraps introducing this medication within an unfolding narrative about how the drug works pathophysiologically. He actually is offering a narrative explanation of its actions, one which reframes the negative effects of lightheadedness, flushing and throbbing headache as nice sensations, positive signs of its efficacy. So the explanatory drive of this narrative suggests that what's felt in the head, tingling, flushing, throbbing, mirrors what's going on in the heart, Ting, uh, um, energetic fizzes, uh, better blood flow, all this taking place uh, under the physician's watchful eye. 
stopwatch in hand. It's a dramatic, it's a dramatic enactment, a piece of theater that transforms an unwanted nocebo effect into its opposite, a placebo. Lowndes' narrated voice derives from experience, confidence and authority and carries agency that contrasts strongly with the silent role the patient is allotted within this drama. Lowne apparently has no qualms about glossing, arguably twisting, the perspective he presents to the patient, which in all probability he'd be arguing it's in their best interests. Narrative is not only or necessarily the best lens through which to apprehend what's going on in a clinical encounter, but it's one approach instinctively used by patients and healthcare staff. In the 1980s, it began to gain scholarly interest. The idea developed that if physicians and nurses could see not just with their eyes, but with their mind's eye and feel the story of a person's illness, they'd appreciate the position of the sick in a different and better way, enabling greater understanding of the altered sense of self, agency and being in the world, which illness often brings. <clears throat> Narrative appreciation, it was argued, would not only propel better listening and thinking attuned to an individual situation, but attuned too to cultural dimensions of illness experiences, to exchanges not only within the consulting room, clinic and hospital ward, but in other fora, bringing medicine, the arts and the humanities into closer contact with each other. These aspirations form part of a broader mix of claims that position narrative as a way of understanding and probing meanings embedded in cultural media related to health, whether this be novels, dramas, films, myths, legal and medical cases, poetry, blogs or illness memoirs. Narrative as a source of learning about illness raises questions about how reliable such accounts may be, how shaped they are by the demands of convention that influence experiences differently if formulated in a clinic from if formulated, for, for example, in a memoir. Lown embeds his advice on nitroglycerin within the sort of narrative he called a clinical pearl. Information gleaned from experience and distilled as a valuable teachable moment, now increasingly disapproved of in evidence-based terms. And people think of pearls as relatively self-contained units of relevant information, as I say, grounded in experience and observation, usually expounded in a slightly kind of anecdotal way uh, by a senior medic, often with very strong performative components to it. It tells others what to do, but not only what to do, but how to do it. It's often pithy. It may use uh, powerful, vivid imagery, humor, illusion, um, double entendre, and very florid sort of lyrical language to emphasize its message. But essentially it's a highly condensed nugget of information with, often with this sort of striking form. And here's an example. Uh, this is a, takes the form of a maxim. No one is dead until they are warm and dead. Now this um, has arisen from a number of cases. It pertains mostly to uh, emergency medicine situations or the medicine of um, the outdoor and the exposed and the cold. And it refers to um, the apparent liminal, almost twilight state uh, between death and coma, uh, which may be indistinguishable from each other, especially when somebody's very cold. And it's grounded in vivid case descriptions involving what's called also resuscitation, the so-called Laz Lazarus effects of people waking up and regaining consciousness actually after uh, resuscitation and CPR have been abandoned. So very sort of vivid um, situation. In chronicling what's happened, what's been experienced, what's taken place, description within a narrative is often paramount. But description itself is not a freestanding form of information. 
it's dependent on forms of interpretative frameworks that help make sense of what is observed. A heart attack feels like this, writes Lance Morrow in 1995 in a memoir called simply Heart. A sickness suddenly surrounds the lungs, a sort of toxic interior glow, fleeting at first, lightly slithering, but returning a moment later, more insistent. Not the crush this time, but an alien something at the core of the body. Something dangerous has come inside and will not leave. It clings to the ribs and lungs and surrounds the heart like tentacles of green gas. Something wrong close in, say the body's alerts. A serpent something in the dark and sweat shoots from forehead and coats palms. Body walks around, walks around quickly to and fro, evaluating and denying. Sweats and panics, calms, panics again. It will pass. A sick green pressure tightens. Not pain precisely, but a kind of terrible foretaste, a measure that something's about to change. Sit, clutch, rest, clutch chest, rock forward and back as at the wailing wall. Stare sidelong, listen. All the instruments turned inward to judge whatever dangerous business has come inside into the familiar dark. Unquote. Comparing the experience to a slithering intrusion by that untrustworthy creature, the something serpent, is how Morrow realises something seriously wrong, close in, as he puts it, a dangerous business in the familiar dark, a toxic gas encircling and exerting pressure, taking hold of him. It's a haunting and elusive image with connotations of biblical evil and overtones perhaps of even chemical warfare, not easy to grasp medically. It's an account with no single, it just means this, reading of what's happening, no simple paraphrase that all comes down to the state of Morrow's pericardial sac or the patency of his coronary arteries. His body responds with semi-helpless movements and a sidelong stare, looking aslant, he senses his own identity and integrity are at stake. A minute passes. Four. Reach for the telephone. Wait. Listen. The wisping menace becomes definite pressure and hardens into pain. It was 6.25 a.m. Unquote. A sinister polymorphous insidious sense of unease, menace and pressure that began merely as a wisp in the chest is often equated with a specific disease. To see why, let's look at William Heberden's account of angina of 250 years ago. There's a disorder of the breast marked with strong and peculiar symptoms. Peculiar means uh, noteworthy in this situation, noteworthy, noteworthy, noteworthy in particular, specific. Considerable for the kind of danger belonging to it and it's not extremely rare. The sense of strangling and anxiety with which it is attended by those afflicted while they are walking, more especially if it be uphill, soon after eating. A most disagreeable sensation which seems as if it would extinguish life if it were to increase or to continue. But the moment they stand still, all this uneasiness vanishes. The pain is sometimes situated in the upper part, sometimes in the middle, sometimes in the bottom of the sternum. It likewise very frequently extends from the breast to the middle of the left arm. The pulse is at least sometimes not disturbed by pain, by, by, by the pain. Males are more liable to the disorder, especially as such have passed their 50th year. After it has continued a year or more, it will come on not only when the persons are walking, but when they are lying down, especially if they lie on the left side. In some inveterate cases, it has been thought it has been brought on by the motion of a horse or a carriage, or even by swallowing, coughing, going to stool or speaking, or any disturbance of mind. I have seen nearly a hundred people under this disorder, of which there have been three women and one boy 
12 years old. All the rest were men. And notice the way that he uses the preposition under here to emphasize or to stress that the, the affliction is kind of on top of the sufferer and part of the kind of crushing pain as he's described it. But it's also associated with an incubus, the idea of a demon actually perched on the chest. The termination of the angina pectoris is remarkable, for if no accident intervene, but the disease go on to its height, the patients all suddenly fall down and perish almost immediately. This is a narration which delineates a generic pattern of illness given medical understanding of the day. Three features of the account are striking. It's characterization, as I say, of a complex pattern of strangling, um, the term angina itself coming from the ancient Greek for to squeeze or to throttle, that starts in the breast and moves about, diminishes or gets worse, depending on bodily position, activity and mental and emotional state. The condition leads to episodes of faintness and eventually to sudden death. Heberden calling the pattern a disorder implies an entity of sorts. A century later, the Queen's physician, Peter Latham, perceptibly hinted at the hybrid nature of this uh, disorder, calling angina an assemblage of symptoms made to bear the name of a disease. And we might say, that's a kind of early formulation of the notion of a syndrome. Secondly, Hebden identifies a wide range of factors that predispose to it, such as being male and over 50, exertion and lying on the left side. And thirdly, the account has an outsider status in that Hebden, the author, has no personal experience himself of this sort of pain though the terms he uses have clearly come from patients with this pain, their own observations, and attempts to verbalise sensations and feelings. From their narrative voices, however, their actual usages are not deployed. Rather, Heberden uses umbrella descriptors such as uneasiness, um, anxiety, disagreeable sensation, um, uh, these are, if you like, umbrella descriptors that uh, are detached from the actual words, the actual formulations of sufferers themselves. And in this reworked form, these terms have become embedded in what is now the template framework for understanding this sort of breast pain. Seeing among the extracts of your account of a disorder which you term angina pectoris, and an, an anonymous um, correspondent wrote to Heberden in 1772, I found it so exactly corresponds with what I have experienced of late years that it determined me to give you such particulars. I am now in the 52nd year of my age, of middling size, a strong constitution, a short neck, and rather inclined to be fat. My pulsations at a medium are about 80 in a minute, the extremes beyond which I scarcely ever knew them, 72 and 90. Quite precise range. I enjoyed from my childhood so happy a state of health as never to have wanted or taken a dose of physic of any kind for more than 20 years. It's about five or six years since I first felt the disorder which you treat of. It always attacked me when walking and always after dinner or in the evening. I never once felt it in the morning, nor when sitting, nor when in bed. The first symptom is a pretty full pain in my left arm, a little above the elbow. And in perhaps half a minute, it spreads across the left side of my breast and produces either a little faintness or a thickness in my breathing. At least I imagine so, but the pain generally lodges in me. Uh, it generally obliges me to stop. I've often felt when sitting, standing, and at times in my bed, what I can best express by calling it a universal pause within me of the operations of nature for perhaps three or four seconds. I felt a shock at the heart, like at which one would feel from a small weight being fastened to a string 
to some part of the body and falling from the table within a few inches of the floor. At times, it will return two or three times in half an hour, at other times, not once a week. As you know, as you have mentioned, several who within your knowledge have died suddenly, I suspect they were subject to what I have delineated. If it please God to take me away suddenly, I have left directions on my will to send you an account of my death to you, to send account of my death to you, with permission for you to order such re-examination of my body as will show the cause of it. I am yours, sir, unsigned, equals unknown. This account, to some extent, uh, is set out in accordance with the template suggested by Heberden, but not slavishly so, for though he adopts the position of an observer, probably a doctor observer, not many people outside the medical profession then read the transactions of the Royal College of Physicians, he, ad he adopts actually the position of a self-observer who reports that his pain starts in the left arm and moves to the breast, the opposite of the origin of the pain and direction of movement of Hebden's template. The author says he's a man of middling size, a strong constitution, a short neck, and rather inclined to be fat. Constitutional elements that feature actually in Hebden's description elsewhere, I couldn't read all of it out. Sensations such as thickness in my breathing and the composite symptom, he explains figuratively, as the sudden tightening of a string which stops an attached weight crashing to the floor, are not symptoms Hebden mentions. The author ascribes the latter to a jolt of his heart that causes a universal pause, which he believes may herald death, uh, not just in his own case, but in others too. Heberden recognised the author's purpose, and only three weeks after he received the letter, uh, the man died, and Heberden published it, saying that it had, it had been written in such a sensible and natural manner that the author would probably neither mistake his own feelings through fancy nor misrepresent them through affectation. I judge it worthy a just and original picture of the disorder. I think the point I'm trying to make here is that um, this is in a way the, the, the manner in which the template, the complex archetypal patterns that we think of as governing our perceptions in medicine develop and evolve through, ad through accretion, through modification, through addition of case description. And it's interesting to see that um, although the description that this author gives are rather different from Hebbidens, he's judging it a true, uh, a true account of this particular disorder. Comparing Hebbidens' original description with those in the letter and in Morrow's memoir, their tones of urgency and hesitancy are somewhat muffled in the template. In Hebbidens' account, uh, if not actually overwritten, you might say. Another way of putting this is that Hebbidens' account is very impersonal. It abstracts from rather than relates to the particular and personal experiences of individuals or sets of individuals and the feelings that concern them. To adopt the language of the sociologists of science, Starr and Bowker, Hebbidens' account of angina is, quote, a desiccated form of a complex narrative, unquote. It doesn't have all the materiality, all the, um, all the kind of palpable uh, sense of what it's like to have this condition. Just how far flung Morrow's description is of chest pain from Hebbidens is really striking. Are the two accounts recognizably about the same sort of condition? Each emanates from very different linguistic conventions for evoking felt realities. We see that the language of Hebbidens diagnostic thinking attenuates and omits much of the strain and uncertainty associated with chest pain the experience, as recounted by these two sufferers two centuries apart. The author of the letter invokes mechanical metaphors, tightening from a weight not quite crushed to the ground, 
whereas Morrow articulates strain in a language of hesitancy and danger, picturing the biblical fall and chemical warfare, symbolisms absent from Hebden's account. The familiar modern phrase taking a history means extracting key terms that translate to or hint at an underlying pathophysiological state. Much of the other meaning contained in patient accounts is considered ponderous, zigzagging, unfocused, informationally noisy, elusive, and lacking signal, and therefore is frequently ignored. But I hope I've indicated these accounts are replete with information that is meaningful and matters to the sufferer who can be helped by engaging with it. A central thesis of the scholar Julia Epstein is that clinical case descriptions are produced to contain human beings, to hold their anarchic potential in check and rein in the threatening aberrational potential of the human body by constraining and narrowing the thoughts and imaginative processes of sufferers themselves, but also listeners, readers, medical students and doctors. As we've seen, when health feels threatened, people adopt a storied lingo in which metaphor and figurative analogy feature and through which fragmentariness and alienation can be communicated. But medical discourse privileges categories, which is what science deals in and calls into question the salience of many of the subjective aspects of illness experience patient testimony. The contemporary sociologist Arthur Frank notes that telling the story of illness for many people does not come easy, as they themselves may be wounded, not just in body, but also in voice. Frank writes, caregivers are confronted not with an ordered sequence of illness experiences, as it appears in Hebden's account, but with a stew of panic, uncertainty, fear, denial, disorientation, unquote. Despite the highly storied context in which clinical case descriptions are constructed, the language of disease which predominates in Western culture is of an authorised account that demotes and marginalises a wide range of voices and linguistic idioms expressive of human reaction to illness. Not only shock, disbelief, anxiety, perplexity, resignation, anger and humour, but responses discussed in symbolic ways in memoirs, fiction, support groups, virtual cultures and protest fora. What sort of patient-centred care and patient partnership is it that ignores the rich tapestry of these narrative voices? Take this verbal account of a man's heart failure and how it was treated, one of several brought together by researchers in Scotland in the 1980s, who found them so memorable that they transcribed them into poetic stanzas. Rather than toning down their connotations, this sort of rendering intensifies the difficulties, desperateness and poignancy of the man's situation. And his determination to continue taking medication he might well die from, rather than become breathless without it. It's a testimonial dialogue involving the patient's wife, the patient, her husband, and refers to their GP and hospital treatment. And his wife, his wife speaks first, and I'll read it out. Well, he's the same again, started, you know, the swelling up. And the doctor didn't put off any time this time. It wasn't a case of trying this and trying that and trying the next thing. She said, just get him in. So he went in at the beginning of December and he actually had been having some rather strange turns. She wanted me in the hospital for the sole reason that she could try things today and at the latest have the results by tomorrow instead of this backwards and forwards. But he had been having these very strange turns. It seemed to be something that came over him, but we realised how bad they were after they had him on the heart monitor because every time he took one on that, it went absolutely crazy. Oh yes, it went absolutely crazy. It's one of the tablets that he has for his asthma, which they say is a very dangerous drug. And we did try to stop it. And I had to phone our own doctor because he was struggling. 
And she came in and she said to him, which would you rather have, you know, the heart out of rhythm or not be able to breathe? He said, well, if I'm going to die, I'd rather die with my heart stopping than gasping for breath. The strange thing is, he's not aware of it being irregular. This is part of a longer poem about this man's experience. Um, and it's actually a tidied up transcription, as I say, that's um, from this study of community care of uh, heart disease in Scotland. But I, I've shown it you because, um, I, I mean, it's got this kind of narrative unfolding quality, but its arrangement in poetic form uh, energizes uh, what the sufferer and the carer have to say, their perceptions, their points of view, the positioning uh, of them as tellers within a social and institutional and moral world, juggling circumstances and choices and how they weigh them up in terms of what they want from their health care, placing accounts in poetic form um, was suggested to the researchers by the couple's voices themselves which not only reflected their culture, accent, idiom, mode of delivery, but helped ensure that their experiences, values, their ways of thinking were heard and considered. Their narrative voices are pungent, the poetic form constituting, I suppose you might say, a technology of recognition that brings out the ethical issues in a personal but also a powerful way. I said, as I said at the start of my talk, um, narrative voices are not only importantly informative in a descriptive and diagnostic sense. In addition to conveying treatment explanations, as we saw with Bernard Lowndes' Pearl on how to take nitroglycerin, they serve expressive and ethical purposes related to individual and social identity and agency, as in the letter to Hebden by the own, unknown doctor. In addition to his symptoms, the letter conveys a strong sense of the author's self-confidence and social standing, despite intimations of his own death. Narrative voices request not only help and relief, but personal recognition. As well as being informative, as we've seen, they can be perplexing, disruptive and resistive, arguing with and opposing officially sanctioned accounts of disease and treatment. In the process, they may help forge new social identities and coalitions of interests. One only has to think of the accounts of living and dying with AIDS in the 1980s and 90s to appreciate the role narrative played in contesting, answering back and opposing standard models of the ethics of bringing new drugs to clinical trial by sufferers and carers demanding instead more rapidly implemented new treatment protocols for AIDS. And you can see that the coalition around COVID and long COVID is having a similar um, uh, effect today. So what I've tried to do in this talk is to attempt to make real the importance for healthcare of narrative voices by looking at a plethora of them in different formats and periods. In their plurality and polymorphousness, narrative voices are an important wellspring of medical knowledge and understanding. Though I focus mostly on enunciation, on emission, this is of course only half the story. The crucial need is for the narrative voices to be heard, dialogued with, considered, responded to and learned from. This, I believe, is a task the medical humanities can help with through its interest in the expressive, descriptive, explanatory, linguistic in its broadest, bodily, language-based, gesture-based sense. Uh, medical humanities, through its interest in narrative and narrative voices, has, I believe, much to contribute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian, for your fascinating talk. Does anybody have any questions?
Perhaps I will start. Um, Excerpts of these you know, medical transactions, I, I, I strongly believe myself, are valuable resources. Oh, I'm covered. Valuable resources um, and, and should be used by educators to discuss different patient perspectives and interpretations of their own bodily symptoms. And I think it's always refreshing to, to try and draw parallels or identify differences between contemporary and historical materials. So I'm just wondering, these transactions are, were digitized by the Welcome Library, if I'm not wrong. Um, are there any sort of databases that you would suggest looking at for those interested in incorporating such materials in the classroom? Uh, there are databases, actually. Um, they, they're, partic they're particularly well developed in uh, discourse, co conversation, linguistics. So uh, there are large numbers of transcribed um, uh of transcribed uh, medical encounters, consultations, uh, and I can send you links to them. They're not necessarily as useful to the medical humanities as you might think, because um, I mean, they're very useful, I think, for uh, the purposes of detailed microscopic analysis of what's going on in a conversation and what the, com what the interaction is like and what sorts of processes are both sort of overt and covert. But I think that um, they're not so useful in terms of the medical humanities because they are dominated by a very linguistic, a very a detailed microscopic linguistic uh, form of analysis. And I think that um, what's useful about using published case histories or materials from novels or from uh, poetry is that it gives you a much greater sense of resonance, much greater sense of um, the wider meaning of these kinds of interactions. So what I suppose I'm saying is that it's complementary. And there aren't, I don't think, medical humanities. I mean, Giskin can correct me, but there aren't medical humanities databases of these sorts of interactions, actually. And perhaps we should be thinking about how to uh, develop them. I think that um, Graham Matthews has a database of particular uh, kind of illness narratives, uh, which might be useful. I, I don't know. I haven't seen it myself, but I've heard about it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. Does anybody else have questions to ask? Thanks, Brian, for that um, interesting talk. Uh, you're still sharing your your screen, so perhaps we could see more of you. <laughs> could you could you perhaps um, stop sharing and then we, then we yeah, can see? Uh, how do I do that? Just a moment. Uh, pause share. Is that it? Stop oh, share. Stop share. Okay, there we go. fine. That's Sorry about me. that. <laughs> That's it. Um, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, uh, uh, I'm just embarking on some conversation analysis myself. Um, and it's incredibly detailed, and I can't see the teaching value of it for our students. <laughs> um, but, but in terms of, of thinking of useful teaching materials, uh, we use care opinion quite a lot, which is a wonderful database of patient feedback that's gone through a moderation process. And um, I think care opinion, it's a social enterprise, and uh, so it, it's interested in improving healthcare. So it's got that, that emphasis, which makes it very relevant. And you can have a look at the dynamics of both what patients say and how those uh, accounts are responded to. And it's incredibly rich narratively. Uh, you know, the, the way some patients adopt the medical lingo uh, as, as a way of showing that they are themselves experts. Um, they kind of, themes that come out about healthcare that connect so well with the th types of, of care we are interested in in the humanities, perhaps the things that take place outside the clinical encounter. You know, it only takes a security guard on the door to be incredibly rude to you for your whole experience of your hospital visit to be overshadowed by that, um, that resentment and that anger that is fueled by uh, a, a a para-clinical encounter, as it were. 
you know, we, we well known people get parking tickets in the hospital car park. It is the last straw. It fuels so much anger and resentment. Um, and, and it seems, and we would say, well, that's got nothing to do with medicine. But actually, it has got everything to do with the patient experience. So I think um, Care Opinion is where we go to for our, our narrative excerpts. But also, of course, film and, and documentaries. It's, you can turn on the TV any hour of the day. I don't know if it's the same in Singapore and get some kind of uh, re- reality show um, <laughs> or a more crafted, considered documentary on medicine. So being alert to using little clips from those. And we're lucky in the UK, we've got a box of broadcasts which which collates these for us and uh, we can access uh, programs through streaming. So we have an educational license for that. But I do find those clips that demonstrate good and um, questionable practice <laughs> are very useful. I, 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 I completely agree. I mean, I, I, I know care opinion and um, that's, uh, that, that is an important source and a useful source. I mean, I think my experience of those sorts of uh, databases is that they're less about the fluidity of emotion I mean, you you know, the, 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 they're less about um, mood, uh, which, of course, you know, uh, can be very dominant in consultations, as you indicate from the car park experience can have a profound effect on the whole mood of a, of a whole set of encounters. And I think that, um, that those rather sort of intangible uh, aspects which can be very dominant in consultations and can, in a sense, um, colour them, discolour them, make them, uh, you know, successful or unsuccessful, and quite hard to get hold of in uh, care opinion. But because it's it is about this very formal kind of feedback response, feedback response sort of um, formula. Yeah, I think that's true. Although I think patients are quite forthcoming in in articulating their emotion. Um, I felt hurt. I felt uh, left out. I felt not listened to. That's the main one, isn't it? I was not listened to, uh, which is a wonderful um, insight into the importance of of narrative and yeah. being given the space and the respect to your story. So I think it's, you, well, you're right. It's never going to catch the richness yeah. of it. Yeah. And, uh, well, I've been looking myself at the documentary series Hospital, the uh, encounters of gratitude in that. So I'm very attuned to the affect mm. that's going on there. Um, but it's it's a skewed sample. I mean, people that agree to to be recorded or take part in research are more likely to have a, a positive spin on things. Um, Unless, uh, but the, <laughs> well, we just think there are lots of negative uh, things as uh, as well, aren't there? People, I think the, the extremes it attracts the extremes. Those are very positive, and those that are incredibly um, got an axe to grind and and feel that they they almost performing the role of an activist. So it's a skewed sample. There's no doubt about it. But then encounters are so rich. We can never hope to. Uh, to generalize fully from them, I think um, it is perhaps the n equals one that that in, that um, paradigmatic example. I think you do this so well in your work, Brian, about bringing out the kind of case histories. What we can learn from close study of just one or two examples that 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 have an um, an authenticity to them that makes us say, mm. "Oh yes, I can learn from that." Or Yes, you can see how that's transferable. Um, I, I, I think one, one thing just to say about this, this, this commonly heard voiced um, feeling, complaint about not being listened to, is um, it's often a very composite feeling. It's not just uh, I haven't been kind of heard. It's actually, as I was alluding to slightly more broadly, it's I haven't been recognised. I haven't been um, accepted as having dot 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 lots of lots of things, a valid point of view, uh, a reliable uh, 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 that I'm a reliable 
commentator or narrator that I'm a trustworthy uh, person just because I've got kind of weird, incomprehensible symptoms or uh, symptoms that I express in ways that are not easily, you can't easily slot into a particular template uh, or pattern of recognition. I think that's what not being listened to is, if you see what I mean. It's all those things that, as you say, go on in narratives in one form or another, but the narrative may not be specifically about the consultation. So it's about picking out those kinds of phenomena from other sorts of cultural experience uh, and cultural encounters and seeing their possible relevance for medicine and healthcare. I think it's also um, it, it's also recognizing that 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 medics are as involved in the telling of stories. I think that's partly why I like the Laun uh, example so much because it is such a, it it has almost mythic qualities to it. I mean, it's taking something kind of negative and worrying and anxious making and turning it into its opposite. It's a kind of magical process that he's engaged in and it's done through narrative. And it's not as if he's an expert in medical narrative in the kind of sense in which it's studied formally, say, in the medical humanities. That's why I sort of say it's partly instinctive. One suspects that this has been going on for thousands of years. And when you when you read the kinds of discourse and the letters that take place in other periods, at other times in different languages, you can see the narrative unfolding and the, the, the narrative dialogue taking place in one form or another, which is untheorized. It's just something that happens and has evolved. But I think that, I suppose what I'm saying is, narrative is not something that patients just, uh, quotes, indulge in. Uh, the whole of healthcare is indulging in it in one way or another. And it behoves us, I think, to become a little bit more self-conscious about it and to try and turn it to a uh, good advantage. Brian, Ian, Ian, Karen here. Good, good to see you Hi. again. Um, my background's in anaesthesia, but mostly as a chronic pain specialist. So the points you were making about not feeling heard, I've heard so many patients say that after they've um, been given the time to explain their perspective. And, and far too often in sort of contemporary medical practice, we don't appear to give patients the time to, to tell their story. We sort of rip a history out of them or take a history. Um, but I always used to encourage my pain fellows to hear the story. And that does require a degree of equity uh, between the uh, storyteller and the story hearer. And, and from the sort of formulaic nature of a lot of histories and you know there's there's a whole manner of very formalized and formulaic sort of symptom based n narratives around you know crushing central chest pain radiating down the yeah you know, this the, these become formulaic mantra and and many patients don't necessarily articulate their histories in quite that same or their stories in quite that same convenient tidy uh, package but it does require, and, and I think this is perhaps something from the medical education side we can ad address, it does require a, a more equitable and less severe power differential between the, the clinician and the patient or the clinician uh, and the recipient of care. I, I, I don't know how we go about this because you have to teach and train some sort of formulaic uh, approach to symptom uh, understanding, but at the same point, um, that's only the start. It's necessary, but not sufficient in my humble view. And to get them to that higher level of just being in the moment with the patient, being equitable, uh, hearing their words for what they are. I mean, I, I gave up trying to be too prescriptive in terms of symptomatology and in favor of 
verbatim recording of we beasties crawling under my skin, um, rivers of ice cold water running down my the back of my leg. These these are far more authentic descriptions than neuropathic pain or uh, hypersensitivity or I mean whatever jargon I could put on them. They're far more compelling when I use the authentic words of the the patient. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I I don't know how we, I mean, maybe there's a a sort of a a sequential evolution, but we seem to only get stuck at first base, so to speak, in that we share the formulaic history taking recipes. Uh, And and you see this in in exams and in OSCEs. The students come in with a whole checklist of questions, which they then proceed to machine gun uh, verbally at the. at the patient, not not waiting to hear the reply, not w- waiting to hear the intonation of the reply. We, we're doing quite a lot wrong in, in this general area, and I, th- I think there's much more to do. But any thoughts on that equity and that power differential and the the importance of authentic language in terms of the, the recording of, of patient symptoms? I think part of my thoughts are kind of this can this can take place at the individual but also at the group level so the group level is quite interesting i was kind of hinting at it with respect to the aids um <clears throat> you know the experience of the marginalized aids groups uh several decades ago um but you get the same thing today say with the way in which uh cardiac pain manifests in certain groups women for example groups you know majority um mm. that, that that is you know, we, we've got this male version template, which doesn't fit um, the way in which half, more than half the population develop chest pain if and when they do. And I think that so it, it works at a group level and it also works at the individual level. The way in which I see it working in the individual level in the medical humanities is if you follow the CHH um, network, uh, in particularly in the USA, to some extent in Canada too, students are encouraged, aren't they, to make their own videos, make their own films of patients talking, um, mostly patients that they visited at home. I think this must be pre-pandemic. Um, and the, the, that is good in many ways because the patient is in the centre of attention, they're being filmed by a, a non-medical, a relatively non-medical expert. So they, they, they've got the floor, they've got the stage in a way that they, they often don't have in the healthcare situation. Uh, the problem is that it's very sentimentalized. I don't know whether, uh, and, and, you know, I think it's worth looking at them from that point of view. So there's a particular kind of music that's been chosen or scenery that's been brought in. And there's a particularly formulaic view of what a story is in this context which um, can be worth drawing out and I think probably the same is true with respect to lots and lots of encounters in pain clinics say Mm -hmm. that I think that the key thing for me is to engender that medical knowledge and understanding is incomplete it's provisional it's full of holes and inadequacies it's full of misapplied stereotypes and you know what i think too much trust is being engendered in particular forms of scientific understanding and knowledge and not enough actually in the kind of face-to-face um uh, moment in which huge amounts of information can be generated and can be received and processed and thought about and pondered and interpreted and reinterpreted and reworked, I suppose is what I'm saying. Um, and I think that's the key in a sense. It's, it's, it's valuing the consultation exchange as a real wellspring of information and uh, potential understanding. I think one of the biggest challenges also, though, is the, the way the system, at least on the face of it, precludes 
time to have these Standing. more. Not sure things seem to be lagging. I I can you you cut out for a moment. Sorry, I was just saying the the, the challenge is the the way the system precludes these more uh, authentic, often slightly longer conversations. Um, and certainly, in my experience, many many chronic pain patients have a have a uniquely personal and uniquely authentic uh, language that they used. Uh, stories that they tell, the, the manner in which it affects them. The, they, they want to tell the whole package. And in a five-minute, six-minute surgical outpatients or an eight-minute, ten-minute general practice consultation, you can see how it's very difficult for that authentic story to be heard in those those contexts. So there's, there is also this sort of wider challenge of what we do systemically to support auth- authentic exchange between clinician and patient and i'm not i'm not sure how we solve that because certainly in my experience giving them the time they need gets you far further down the track of understanding what the issues and challenges are and how to help explore either coping strategies understanding or or, or educating them further such that they can move on with their lives and uh, we, we seem to be completely invested in time and short packets of time in the the sort of on the altar of efficiency when when actually hearing the story in its fullest and most authentic sense is is perhaps the most economical thing to do of of all yeah well time is the ultimate container isn't it for us um it's 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 the i mean when i quoted julia epstein saying that um medical categories are designed to contain and constrain, you know, uh, the category of, of, of you know, the, the limited time, the time frame uh, is, a, is another form of that. Um, I think it, 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 it's, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a real problem. I mean, I, I personally think Um, and uh, to get them to appreciate that people Hello, Brian. Are you there? Oh, he left. <laughs> Seems to be going super slow, or is it just just my connection? Really laggy. No, it was laggy as well on my side. Yeah, I think uh, maybe the storm is interfering with the Wi-Fi. I don't know if that's plausible, but. <laughs> yeah, I think have we lost them all together now? Let's wait for I a don't bit. see him anymore. <laughs> yeah, let's wait for a bit to see whether he is able to join back. Actually, I'll, I'll just say goodbye now. I've got another meeting at um, at half past, but it was lovely to see you all, and thank you so much. I'm sorry I wasn't able to participate for the. The whole um, two days, it sounds amazing, but good luck in everything you're doing and um, and thank you so much. Thank you. Hope Eunice treats you well. Or well, not too badly. Britain's being battered by a once in a century storm, Storm Eunice at the moment. So maybe that's complicating things as well. Ah, 
Here comes Brian. Hi, very sorry. I don't know what happened there. Was it just me that disappeared? Yes. Yes. It's all right. We missed your last couple of sentences as well because it was lagging a little. Would you like to reshare your thoughts? Not sure I can remember. <laughs> um, I was really just talking a little bit about um, kind of uh, thinking about the diversity of communication style and idiom uh, in different groups, different um, uh, different sorts of people. I get the impression that in the UK, communication studies, communication skills have been taught in quite a stereotypical way that hasn't acknowledged that different sorts of people have rather different styles of interaction and communication. And I think that the importance of introducing students to the sheer variety of possible approaches and the importance of respecting those different kinds of approaches of, you know, of ways of being, di you know, people often express themselves in elliptical and digressive ways. That is the way they communicate. And it's no good uh, labeling them as, you know, poor historians, unreliable uh, narrators or whatever, because that is their communication style. It's quite... <laughs> You know, and, and if you do that, you're effectively cutting them off from from in, from contact, contacting you. I mean, it's a form of unconscious bias in some ways, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's uh, because you don't fit this formula convention yeah. of efficient history teller. Yeah. You, you will be you will be not prejudiced against. Well, sometimes it is, you know, they get they get stigmatized or labeled as. Poor, like you say, poor story and a difficult patient. Uh, yeah, that's a very real phenomenon, I'm afraid. Mm. Mm. And once it's in the notes, once it's actually, you know, uh, in the air, it's a real, how you get delabeled is, a, again, yeah. a, a very problematic issue. Um, yeah. Inquin, I think you had a question in the chat earlier. I think it's been partly answered actually, but, but I guess the point is that um, uh, clinical communications really take uh, so many different types of skills and, and that's what we really struggle with. Uh, students have said that the lack of medical knowledge in the first place actually hampers the whole conversation because they don't even know where to start. And, and I guess the other aspect is about really situational uh, awareness and cultural awareness. Uh, for example, you, you do not continue if you see a patient crying right in front of you. Uh, at least for the next few seconds, you have to take a break and, and really check in on the patient. So, so I think that's always a struggle to teach because that does come with experience. Um, and that comes with a lot of uh, sensitivity as well. So, so I think that's, that's part of the difficulty that, that I was trying to, to see whether there was any solution from, from your point of view. Um, yeah, but, but I guess the, the fact that we do have a bank of uh, narratives for, for students and doctors to look through after the clinical consult, I think that, that is helpful by itself already. And if you move the communicator away from the very stressful situation, I think it's also easier for them to, to really be a bit more immersive in, in the kind of conversation that they're viewing at that point of time. And then you can bring in a mentor or facilitator to further go through the conversation. I, I think that will be helpful as well. Yeah, I think that um, there is a there is a, a real problem about sort of, you know, chicken and egg and what comes first and how much experience do you need and how much knowledge do you need in order to make sense of what's going on in the consultation and how can you learn, how can you learn from it when there's, it's, there's so much material? Um, I, and, and uh, I mean, at least again, you know, I'm drawing on you, my own UK experience is that I've often found that the way in which consultation skills have been taught are rather stark, they're rather extreme. So you, you're looking at very kind of um, hard and fast, black and white kind of issues or problems, rather than 
um, much more nuanced, much more fluid, much less easy to categorize kinds of interaction or phenomena or communication. So you're looking for, you know, it's often taught through this very, um, you know, this, this categorical kind of uh, uh, approach that at least you've got something secure to hold on to, if you see what I mean. But that cause, of course, comes with its own problem, which is that in many consultations, you may not have that. Thank you. As you're reaching the end, does anybody else have any questions for, for Brian? Or Brian, any last words you'd like to share? Um, I just think this is an, an area of uh, tremendous possibility, um, especially in medical education. I think it's really exciting that Singapore is um, engaging with this whole area of conversation and in fact is leading on, on it in many respects. So um, I, I just wish you all the best and I'm very keen to uh, keep an eye on what is going on and to hear how, how it's developing. Um, uh, I think that the uh, the, the, the opportunity for the humanities to learn uh, from healthcare as much as from healthcare to learn from it is, is huge. Um, and, I, and I just hope that um, you will be able to realize benefits from it in practical as well as in uh, more theoretical ways. So good luck.